Oh, ho, ho. good morning, good morning, good morning. Today is Thursday, September 15th, 2022, and I am Kenny Polcari, your host of the party, and what is happening today? Well, here's what you need to know, right? Investors and traders and algos took a break yesterday, so stocks were allowed to breathe a little bit and stabilize. And there was an 11th hour rail workers contract deal. Guess what? It's still tentative, though. The PPI confirms what we learned from the CPI on Tuesday. Prices are still too damn high. Oil pushing higher at $89 a barrel. The U.S. is rumored to be replacing the Strategic Petroleum Reserve when oil trades down to $80. Futures are up slightly this morning. Lots of eco data to digest. And what are we having for dinner? We're going to try the sweet sausage, the, gr uh, the grilled sausage, the uh, chicken thighs, and sweet vinegar peppers. Oh, delish. Now, in case you were really worried about a freight rail strike on Friday that threatened to bring the U.S. economy to its knees and hurt long-distance Amtrak service, you can rest easy. As expected, everybody pushed up right up until the 11th hour and then came to a deal. All very dramatic, with the headlines making it clear that an agreement came after 20 consecutive hours of negotiations. What that leaves out is the fact that these negotiations have been going on for three years. The 140,000 rail workers have been frustrated that they have not gotten a raise since 2019. Uh, and now they're getting mauled by 40-year high inflation. They want enough of a raise to offset the damage done by soaring prices. They want more time off and they want better working conditions, right? All good, but all a problem for the White House. The White House and the Labor Secretary, Marty Walsh, taking credit for bringing the multiple sides together and striking a deal. But let us be clear, it is still tentative. But rail stocks are up this morning. UMP quoted up $5 or 2%. CSX quoted up 50 cents or 1.5%. And Norfolk Southern quoted up $5 or 2%. Now, yesterday, stocks swung between gains and losses after the PPI report confirmed what the CPI told us on Tuesday. Inflation is not going away anytime soon. PPI yesterday reported that year-over-year -year inflation rates at the producer level came in at plus 8.7%, while the year-over-year -year PPI X food and energy came in at 7.3%, both in line with the expectations that everyone was prepared for. In fact, maybe even a bit weaker uh, as supplies appeared to be cutting prices. So that's, so that's good, and stocks took a breather. The S&P only swung 49 points between high and low. Lots of talk and discussion about what the action on Tuesday meant for investors and portfolios. Everyone playing Monday morning quarterback as they tried to point to the causes and then the outcomes. We're now hearing more and more from Fed heads and street analysts that are calling for a deeper recession, much more than anticipated, some even defining it as a coming depression. Now, that's not good at all, but let's not go there at the moment. By the end of the day, the Dow added 30 points. The S&P was up 14. The Nasdaq gained 87. The Russell added 7 points. And the transports gave up 56 points. All the talk of the 100, 125 basis point increases uh, in the Fed funds rate next week seemingly beginning to fade. The smart money is betting that it's going to be a 75 basis point hike that we prepared ourselves for, and that's going to be what we get. And so the markets calmed down a bit, as did investors. The two-year Treasury, which is the most sensitive to policy changes, jumped by another three basis points on top of the 22 basis points that it advanced on Tuesday, creating even more of a divide between the twos and the tens, suggesting that the recession is marching ahead. Uh, and that's not necessarily a good thing. But yes, the yield curve remains inverted across all the years, right? The twos, the fives, the tens, everything's inverted. And it's 13th week, by the way. Now, many were expecting a snapback rally yesterday, but the, but the fact that stocks were not able to ricochet more than they did is causing some disappointment for the bulls. But let's see what today brings. And today brings uh, a couple of things. Uh, both Vlad and Gigi are getting together in Uzbekistan. The first time the two have met since Vlad invaded Ukraine. And only weeks ahead of Gigi being crowned leader for life. Tons of speculation about what this meeting is going to produce. Many saying that Gigi is going to encourage Vlad to reconsider the invasion and find a way to peace. While others are saying, ah, uh -uh, not so fast. He's got no such intention. 
Expect to hear more about this over the day. In the end, the media is not going to price stocks, but it will keep the chaos alive, right? And that's kind of, uh, you know, that'll create some short-term chaos here and there, but it won't in the end price stocks. Oil continues to push higher. Yesterday, piercing its 200-day moving average uh, as traders assess the outlook for Chinese demand after China began easing up on lockdowns in Chengdu, right? Efforts to refill the strategic petroleum reserve after Joey succeeded in draining it is also on traders' minds. Bloomberg reported that discussions about refilling it revolve around crude oil prices falling below $80 a barrel. So big support, right, at the $80 level because someone's going to be buying it. This morning, West uh, WTI is trading at $88 a barrel after testing as high as $89.50. $89.70 is the trend line, so this is a key level to watch. Difficulty getting through this is going to dictate the next move. Failure to keep, failure to keep us, uh, failure to go through will keep us in the $83, $89 range, while a push up and through will see us challenge $100 in short order. And the action yesterday saw energy lead the way higher, right? The XLE up 2.8%, was way out in front, followed by utilities, which are up eight tenths of a percent, continuing the theme that investors are overweighting both those sectors as volatility remains a concern. Those are the only two sectors out of the 11 major S&P sectors that are positive on the year, up 47% and 7% respectively. Real estate and basic materials led the way lower, each falling about 1.2%, leaving both of those sectors down 20% and 17% respectively. Coal and natural gas stocks, right? Part of the en energy complex also saw tons of interest. B2 up 3%, while Comstock was up 8%, bringing both those names up 130 and 162% respectively. So you see there is sunshine somewhere. Now, gold's at an important crossroad. It pierced 1,700 this morning, trading as low as 1,694, but it has since rallied back. But it's struggling to hold on. The dollar index, which has been under pressure over the past week, shot higher overnight and is trading at 109.62, up from last week's lows of 107.60. Currency traders are now betting that given the latest inflation data, the Fed is not gonna slow down anytime soon. And that's going to send the dollar higher, which in the end will put pressure on the commodity complex as commodities are priced in dollars. So the relationship is inverted. A stronger dollar forces commodity prices lower. A weaker dollar forces commodity prices higher. The dollar, uh, the dollar high is 110.70. So that's the level to watch. A breakout there will send the dollar higher and that will put renewed pressure on commodities while a failure there will help them stabilize. Eco data today includes a range of reports. Empire Manufacturing of negative 12.9, which is up from negative 31. So that's a positive. Philly Fed survey of 2.3. Retail sales month over month of negative one tenth of a percent, while retail sales, X autos and gas are supposed to be up five tenths of a percent. Industrial production of 0%, capacity utilization of 80.2%. Remember, capacity utilization number greater than 80% continues to suggest inflationary pressures. And that would confirm what we learned from both the CPI and the PPI. U.S. futures are up again this morning as they try to find some stability. Dow futures up 70, S&P's up 8, the Nasdaq's higher by 11, and the Russell is up by 2. The fact that we did not see any significant follow-through after Tuesday's route is encouraging. But don't go out yet and celebrate, right? Inflation and the coming earnings season remain the dark clouds that hang over the economy and the markets. And while we get more data on inflation, earnings start the second week of October, and that will be the next hurdle for the markets and investors, right? Will we see a significant slowdown in the reports? What will the C-suite say about the next six months? What effect will higher rates have on consumer psyche? What about margins? Are they under pressure? Now, that's a rhetorical question because, of course, they're under pressure. But we're going to learn how much pressure that is. Now, you know me. Uh, I remain cautious about the coming earnings season. We've already heard of lots of companies getting rid of people. Now the financial services sector, and they're the first ones to report, right? Goldman, JP Morgan, expect the others too, right? I'm being patient, which doesn't mean I'm paralyzed. It just means I'm putting money to work in the handful of names that I believe should be at the core of anyone's long-term portfolio. You know the names and big market cap names. European markets are up. French inflation data is due out later today. And the Bank of England policy meeting, which was due out today, has been put on hold due to the death of Queen Elizabeth II. 
Expect to hear more about that next week. At 7 a.m. this morning, markets were up fractionally. I mean, just fractionally, right? Trading right around the unchanged line. The S&P gained 13 points yesterday, leaving it at 39.46. After testing lower on Wednesday than it did on Tuesday before it recovered. 39.46 is key. That is the trend line drawn from the lows of June. The S&P needs to hold this line or it risks testing 3,800-ish, which then sets it up to test the June lows of 36.60 if the earnings season is poor, just as we enter, right? Just as we start to enter and go through earnings season. Remember, we're in a seasonally difficult time of the year. September and October remain volatile, and a test lower is still very much a reality. Stick with the big, boring names. I pay decent divvies and take advantage of lower prices. Okay, so what do we have for dinner tonight? So this is really great. You use both the grill and the oven. It's uh, Italian sweet sausage. You can use hot if you want. Chicken thighs, skin on, bone in, and sweet vinegar peppers, right? Um, so for this, you need the thighs, like I just told you. You need salt and pepper, olive oil, the sweet Italian sausage, the vinegar peppers. You need butter, garlic, white wine, chicken broth, marinated artichoke hearts. Uh, and then the total time to cook this is probably one hour or so, start to finish, maybe a little bit longer. You want to preheat your oven 375 degrees. Preheat the grill so that you can start cooking the sausages. You want to season the chicken pieces with salt and pepper. Heat up some olive oil in the frying pan. When it's hot, and it should be really nice and hot, um, reduce the heat to medium high, turn on high, then reduce the medium high, and now add the chicken and brown it on all sides, right? Maybe 10 minutes by the time you brown it on all the sides, get it nice and, 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 uh, and uh, nutty, right? Now, remove it and place those in a baking dish and then put that in the oven and continue to cook it for another 30 minutes or so. Now, cook the sausage on the grill. Careful not to burn it, maybe 10 minutes. Remove the sausages from the grill after they're cooked. Let them rest for three or four minutes and then cut them into just bite-sized pieces, right? In the meantime, add the chopped garlic to the frying pan that still has all the juices and oil in it from the chicken, along with the sliced vinegar peppers. Saute that around, right? You're not really looking to cook the vinegar peppers. You just want them to get nice and hot. Now add the sausage to that pan. Add a dollop of butter and some white wine. Reduce that. Reduce the wine. Let the alcohol burn away. Maybe five minutes. Next, add the chicken broth and the artichoke hearts and saute for another five to eight minutes. Now, take the chicken out of the oven. By this time, it's been about a half an hour. Reintroduce the chicken to the frying pan. Mix it all together and allow it to simmer for two or three more minutes. Now, when it's done, you want to serve this on a large family-style platter right in the center of the table, accompany it with a large mixed green salad, um, and maybe uh, either a potato, a roasted potato, or roasted potatoes, or a baked potato, or maybe uh, sautéed spinach, or broccolini, or string beans, something green. Uh, always works well with this. In any event, it's a great dish to have if you have a company on a Saturday afternoon or a Sunday afternoon. It's a great dish to make. It serves well. It serves a lot of people. And it is delish. In any event, the day is about to get started. It looks like it's going to be a little cloudy here today. I don't think there's any rain coming. And certainly not a storm predicted. But it is Florida, and that can change on a dime. In any event, have a great day and take good care.